This message comes to you from Withenshaw Community Church, Manchester. We hope that you are inspired and challenged by God's Word. So this morning, um, I want us to continue with a new series that we started. And this series is on uh, one of the great prophets in the Old Testament, uh, Prophet Elijah. Now, what I want to do this morning, I want to give you a bit of a context uh, for those that were not here last week. Uh, but also as a refresher before I go into the Word this morning. Now, when Prophet Elijah was alive and living at the time that God called him to, um, you know, prepare him for his ministry, um, it was a time where northern, in the northern kingdom there were over 200 years, about 19 different evil kings that ruled one after the other. Just imagine, 200 years, 19 evil kings, every one of them are worse than the other. And then the 19th king, which was King Ahab, was the worst of the worst. I mean, it couldn't get worse than that. <laughs> it was really bad. So God had to step in and uh, get someone uh, to come in and, 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 and God used Elijah. But King Ahab also had a wife and his wife uh, was also really... Um, wicked and, and a really horrible woman and her name was Jezebel. So the scripture says that King Ahab did more evil in the sight of the Lord than any other kings. And what King Ahab was doing was turning people's heart away from the one true God. And he was turning their hearts to worship false gods. We talked about the false gods that they were worshiping at the time. There were two of them in particular, uh, God of Baal, which is the God of sun, God of fire. That's what they were worshiping. And there was another God that they worshiped as well, and that's the God of Asherah, which was really the wife to God of Baal. So... People were no longer worshipping the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel, but instead they were worshipping these false gods. I want to tell you this morning that the most important thing, the most important thing above everything else that God wants you to do, God wants to have your heart. He wants to have your heart. He wants to have our worship he wants to have our focus. He wants to have our adoration. He wants to have everything, okay? Um, if you think about it, what's the first command of, what's the first uh, of the Ten Commandments? We shall have no other gods before me. You should have no other gods before me, right? And then when the people were asking Jesus, Jesus, what is the greatest commandment of all? What is the greatest? And Jesus said, above everything else, above everything else, we have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. You need to love the Lord your God. And we need to really remember that God wants all our heart, not just part of it, all of it. Right? Not just part of it, all of it. And we know how we have, a say, we have an enemy, right? Satan. Satan is our enemy and he wants to hurt God. So what does he do? What does he do? He takes the heart of the people away from the one true God. By making them worship false God. Idols. And even today we're in danger of worshiping false gods. Now, what does a false God do? Just think about it. What does a false God do? You see, a false God makes a promise that only God can deliver. A false God makes a promise that only a true God can deliver. And, and I was thinking about this. What are some of the false gods that we have in our day and age, we don't, we don't worship Baal, we don't worship Asherah, you know, but what, what is some of the false gods that are in our lives today? And I was thinking about this, and, and, and one in particular that, that's very strong is money. We all chase after money. We all want more of it. And what does money say? Money says, you know, um, the more of me you have, the happier you are. The more secure you are, Right? 
the, the more the more happier you get the more of me you get the more security you have the more and and makes all these false promises and a lot of people listen to these false promises and they chase after this false god and then you know, you can become the richest man in the world and the, be the richest person. And then you get the diagnosis of a cancer. And then you realize that no matter how much money you have, how much money you have, it's not going to bring you happiness. It's not going to bring you safety. It's not going to be worth anything. What is that? As a false God giving you a false promise that only God can deliver. And there are a lot of false gods in our lives. Another thing that uh, young people, especially, uh, you know, in, in, in you, you, you know, is fame. People want to be famous. Insta-famous, right? They want to become footballers and musicians and movie stars. And they think, okay, you know what? Once I become famous, I will have happiness. You know what? Are, 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 are all, all famous people the happiest people? No, right? A lot of times, famous people, because of the emptiness that is in their heart, they turn into drugs and alcohol. Even some of them, they go as far as committing suicide because, trust me, that's a false God that's making a false promise that only God can deliver. You want happiness, you serve God. You see, a lot of times we can be, you know, uh, running after this, all these false gods and, 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 and they're all false promises. So King Ahab was turning people's heart away from the one true God. And, and, and Elijah, who, who, who comes to confront this king, and he says, because of your idolatry, because of all the things that you're doing, because of all the things that you have done, God is going to stop the rain. There's not going to be any more rain. Until God says, I should pray and ask for the rain to return. Then there's this major, major drought and people are dying and it's horrible. If has anyone experienced drought, it's horrible. And then it's interesting because God then takes Elijah into this season of preparation, right? Straight away after that incident, it just takes him away to the season of preparation where God is actually taking him into this season of loneliness. And then, and then he says, you know what? I want you, Elijah, to be totally dependent on me. So he takes him into this season of dependency. And then he says, you know what? I want you to be totally surrendering to me. And then he's in the season of total uh, you know, surrender. And then when he's ready... God does something amazing through this man of God that only he could achieve by going through a season of preparation. For the first time ever in his time, he was ready. He actually, this, this is the first time we can see in his time that he gets to a place where he takes this dead boy and he takes it up in the upper room and he prays and asks God to raise this dead boy back to life and he comes back to life. And you know why? Because God was doing something in him, preparing him for what God wanted to do through him. And we said, a lot of us this morning, we might be feeling that like we're in a season of loneliness or in a season of uh, uh, total dependency and, 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 and total surrender. God wants you to prepare, be prepared for the great things that he has in store for you. But sometimes you have to go through that season of preparation. It's not that God has forgotten about you. He's just preparing you. He's doing something inside of you so that he can do something through you. Amen. So today we want to jump to chapter 18. And after a season of preparation, uh, God sends Elijah back to confront this evil king again. But before we do that, because Elijah has a prophetic message for the, the king and the, the people of his time. And I really believe that this prophetic message is for us today as well. And I really believe it is for us today especially. <laughs> but we know we have an enemy who wants to, uh, you know, bring distractions. Help us not to really get the message. So I want us to pray. I want you to pray. And ask God, God. Prepare my heart to be able to hear you 
Father, we just want to come right now before you and we want to ask that you remove all distractions, Father God. Help us to really hear what you have to say this morning. Father, we prepare in our hearts to hear what you have to say through this great prophet, prophet Elijah. And and speak to us today because we want to hear from you. We want to respond to your message this morning. So we commit ourselves to you. Use me this morning as your instrument. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, we pray. Amen and amen. So the Bible says three years after the drought, and like I said, drought is a horrible thing. If anyone has experienced drought, you know, the dry land, everything dies. The smell of death is just in the air because everything dies when there's no water. And it's been three and a half years, and then God sends Elijah to confront this evil king. And in chapter 18, verse 17, it says, King Ahab, when he saw Elijah coming to him, he said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? Now, I was looking at the word troubler in Hebrew word. It it can actually be translated as a snake as well. So he's basically saying, hey, you, no good, low down snake. It's, it's, It's your fault that all these people are dying. It's your fault that it's all this is happening. It's your fault you caused this death. Is you, you, you snake, you horrible person. And then and then Elijah turns around in verse 18 and says, I've not made trouble for Israel, but you and your father's family have abandoned the Lord's command and have followed the bowels. So Elijah is like you have committed sin of idolatry. You have. And you are putting false gods ahead of the true one, true, true God. And Elijah was confronting this very popular idea at the time that, you know, uh, that there are multiple gods. And, and it's actually, you know, there, there is two terms at the time. And even today, there's monotheism. Monotheism is the belief that there is one God, right? We as Christians, we are monotheistic. We believe that there's only one God. And then there's the idea of polytheism, which believes multiple gods, and Elijah was confronting this very polytheistic culture, and he was saying where they were worshiping multiple gods. And, and I was thinking even today as Christians, you know, even though we're supposed to be this monotheistic, we need, we need to, we, we, even though we're supposed to believe there is only one God, we actually live a very polytheistic life. Where we believe there's one God, but we worship and serve many, many, many false gods. Many false gods. We're not worshiping false gods of Baal or Asherah, like I was saying. But we are, uh, you know, uh, we're literally worshiping false gods of uh, uh, money, material possessions. It could be, it could be your house. And you're literally worshiping your house. And you you just, that, that means everything to you. It could be your image and you're spending hours and hours behind the mirror and just, just fixing up. You know what I mean? It could be your career and you're spending all your time on your career and you're putting God on the side. You're saying, God, I'm too busy for you. I'm, I'm focusing on my career right now. It could even be your hobby. I was thinking it could even be your favorite football club, right? <laughs> I was thinking about myself. Me and my boy, like, sometimes you're watching football and we're just like, go on, Chelsea. But, <laughs> but it could be even your favorite football club. And we have all these false gods. I mean, I was thinking even it could be your family. Even something as good as your family, it, be- it can become a, like a god where you, you see any time that you elevate anything, anything, into the rightful place of the one true God, it's called idolatry. It's called idolatry. It can be your spouse. It can be your children. It can be anything. Anything that comes in that rightful place is called idolatry. Sometimes we put, uh, you know, sometimes we put so much time and effort, right, into our work, which we should do. It's important but it should never take the place of God. 
It should never take the place of God. Sometimes school. Yes, children, you have to study hard. You have to work hard. But it should not take the place of God. A lot of times, sadly, you know, young people have really great relationship with God. And then they go to university and then they stop going to church and they're saying, now I'm in this season and I need to focus on my education. And, and they put God aside and they just say, now I'm in this season. I need to, trust me, you can, you can, you can, you can, you can put all your effort, but if you don't have God's favor, you, you, you know, you need God's favor. And we, are, we have to be very careful because if we're not careful, we can have false gods in our lives. Without even knowing. And uh, then Elijah delivers this prophetic message, like I said, to, to, the, uh, to the Israelites. But also this prophetic message is for us today. And he says it's time to quit wavering. It's time. Stop. Quit. Wavering. And that's the title of my message this morning. And it literally says stop going back and forth. Stop going back and forth. And then he calls for this amazing showdown. In verse 19, it says, Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. And, and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah, who eats at Jezebel's table. Did you hear that? 400 prophets of Asherah. And they were all eating at Jezebel's table. Just imagine how big this table is. 400 prophets are eating at her table. In verse 20, So Ahab sent a word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets of, uh, on the Mount Car Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, How long, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Make a decision. Follow who you think is real. Stop wavering around. Stop, stop being in between two opinions. And I was thinking about this a lot of times as Christians, we can be, well, God, I want to go to heaven. I want to go to heaven, but I still want to do whatever I want to do. I'm not willing to submit myself to you. I want to go to heaven, but I want to live my life. I want you to answer all my prayers. I want you to bless me, but I don't want to obey your commands because they're too hard. You know, it's just too hard. You know, I want to I wanna be a Christian on Sunday, but don't ask me to be Christian during the week. Come on now. I, I, I'm happy to come on church on Sunday, but the rest of the week, I want to do me. I want to live my life. And Elijah is saying, man, quick, quit, quit, quit claiming Christ and live like you don't even know him. Just stop it. Stop calling yourself a Christian and live a, a, a life that doesn't even involve Christ into your life. Quit wanting the benefits and not be willing to even offer a sacrifice. How can we ask God to bless us when we're not willing to offer a sacrifice to him? And then Elijah says, choose what you believe and serve what you believe, okay? Pick a side and quit wavering around, man. Stop it because it doesn't help you. If you really believe in John 3, 16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If you really believe that Jesus is the son of God, is the one true God, then quit waving around. Stop serving other gods. Serve him. Because Jesus warned us. It's interesting because in John 3.16 it says this. And then in Revelation 3.16, uh, it's interesting because it's Revelation 3.16. It says, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. 
Wow. <laughs> so he does want us to be hot. Just think about it. Jesus is saying, I don't want you to be a Christian, one fit in, in, in church, another fit in the world. He's saying, choose. Choose. Either be cold or be hot. But do not be lukewarm. How many like here uh, drinking anything lukewarm? It's not nice, is it? And Jesus is saying, man, I don't want you to be lukewarm. You know why? Because I will just spit you out. I'll spit you out. That's a warning to us. If you really believe in the one true uh, God, then live your life fully devoted to him. Serve him. Worship him. Put him first. Because in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33, Jesus said, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things that you're running after, everything else that you're running after will be given to you as well. A lot of times we want to do things our way and then we get frustrated. But God is saying, you know what? First seek me. Seek me with everything. I promise you, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. But don't devote yourself to all these false gods that want to promise you all these false things that it, it, it can't even be delivered because I can only deliver you happiness. Then Elijah calls for this showdown in, in verse 22. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Get two, bowls of, uh, get two bowls for us. Let Baal's prophet choose one for themselves and let them cut it into pieces and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. They're saying like, look, you know, you pick the bull that you think is right. You go and select the one that you think is going to, you know, God's going to, your God is going to be happy with. Start cutting it up. Offer it to your God, but don't set fire, okay? And then it says, I will prepare the one bowl that, and I'll put the wood, but I would not set it to fire. In verse 24, then you call out to the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. Why do you think people were saying what you say is good? They were thinking, man, Elijah, you're an idiot. Don't you know that we serve the God of bow, the God of fire, the God of sun? You think my, our God is not going to answer us when we call out for him to send fire? You're going to lose this battle, man. We serve the God of bow. So they said, what you say is good. And then in verse 25, Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. He wants to make sure, don't light the fire. Verse 26, so they took the bull given them and prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us. They shouted, but there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. Baal, you are the God of fire. You are the God of sun. Answer us. So they shouted and shouted and shouted. They started dancing for that. They started dancing. They fall on dancing and shouting around this altar. And I was thinking about it. Nobody, nobody in our times does that, does it? Do they? I think we do, right? When you go to a concert, when you go to a concert, when you go to a club, and you're dancing and and praising or your favorite singer or even when you're in a 
in a stadium and you, or even behind the TV and you're watching your favorite club. <laughs> what a noise we make <laughs> when they score. <laughs> We dance. <laughs> but these guys are dancing and dancing and shouting louder and shouting louder and nothing is happening. And I love this because Elijah decides to mess around with them. He's, he's finding it quite funny. Then in, in, in verse 27 it says, At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is a God. Surely he is a God. Perhaps he's in a deep thought. Perhaps he's busy. Perhaps he's traveling. Or maybe he's sleeping and he must be awakened. Go on. Shout louder. Louder. And louder. Then from verse 28 to 35. It just, they just went ballistic. They just went ballistic. If I can have the worship team back up, please. And they started shouting louder and louder and louder and dancing faster and faster. <laughs> and the Bible says they even started cutting themselves, thinking maybe we need to sacrifice some of our own blood. Maybe that's when God of Baal would respond to our request. So from morning to night, they just continued on and continued on. But there was no answer. Nothing, nothing happened. And in verse 36, it says, At the time of sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed. Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. And that I am your servant and you have all, done all these things that you have commanded. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts back to you. Can you see how beautiful this prayer is? How beautiful this prayer is. God, answer me. God, answer me. God, reveal yourself. Show yourself. Show them who you are. Let us see you. Reveal yourself. So we may feel the heat of your love. Why? So that you may turn the hearts of your people back again. Because they used to know you. They used to follow you. They used to walk with you. They used to worship you. But now they don't. Their heart is turned to other gods. All these false gods. But God, show yourself this morning. So they can turn their hearts back to you. And I was, as I was preparing this message, I was thinking, I, 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 God, God literally so, spoke to me and said, you know what? There are a lot of, People this morning that you might be here this morning or you might be watching this online, you were passionate about God. One, uh, you know, there was a time that you were so passionate. You were so close to God. You were walking with Him. But not anymore. You have allowed false gods, a combination of false gods to come into your life. And God is saying today, I want to reveal myself to you. I want to reveal myself to you. I want to show you that I'm real. But you have to make a decision. You have to make a decision. If I am the true God, then serve me. But you can't be in between. Then in verse 38, the fire of the Lord fell and burnt up the sacrifice. The wood, the stones and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. Scripture says it burned everything. Can you just imagine? 
Because they had put all this water on, this, on the wood and just making sure that it doesn't light up quickly. The fire from heaven came down, burned the wood, burned the soil, burned the offering, and, and licked up all the water off the wood. In verse 39, then it says, When all the people saw this, they felt prostrate and, and cried out, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. He is God. He is God. If you can stand for a moment, we just want to commit ourselves to Him this morning. Maybe, maybe it was you. Maybe it was you that you were so passionate about God. But things came and, and distracted you from the one true God. And God wants to reveal Himself to you. He wants to reveal Himself to us, to all of us this morning. Father God, we want to ask you this morning that we would be humbled. And in the spirit of repentance this morning, that we would dethrone all the idols that are standing in the place where you want to be in our lives. Father, we want to repent of the sin of idolatry in our lives. Father, we want to follow you. Help us to quit wavering around. Help us to really choose you and follow you. We want to serve you with all our hearts this morning. Father, I want to pray that you give us the eyes to see all the different areas of our lives that's with sin, that breaks your heart. Reveal those things to us right now. Lord, as you're revealing those things to us, we want to confess those sins to you and we want to ask that you cleanse us this morning, God. Cleanse us this morning. We recognize that we, we, don't, we don't have the ability to overcome the sins of idolatry ourselves. We can't do it. But we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on our behalf. And, and we need your help this morning. We need your help. So we ask God that you help us this morning. Would you be so great and help us to overcome our weaknesses, the things that we struggle with, Help us, Lord. We want to serve you. We want to worship you with all our hearts, all our minds, all our soul, with all our strength. Help us, Lord. We want to stop waving around and we want to fully commit ourselves to you. If that's your prayer, we pray this in Jesus' mighty name and all God people say, Amen. Amen. And amen. Now, I want us to go into a time of Holy Communion. If I can have the ushers come and um, please help with distributing the elements. Please don't take the uh, communion yet. We want to do it together. But we want to go into a time of worship. And I want you to ask God. Continue praying. Reveal God. Say, God, reveal those things that are not pleasing to you. Maybe, maybe there are some false gods in my life that I need to be aware of. Show me those things. And I want us to pray before we take the, the, the communion together. And we want to ask God to strengthen us. Amen. Amen. We hope you've been inspired and challenged by this message. For more information about Withenshaw Community Church Manchester, please visit withenshawcommunitychurch.org.